Lift off in three, two, one. Welcome back to the Body Mind Index channel, your go-to resource for achieving holistic well-being. And today we have a very special treat for you as we dive deep into the world of mental health and personal growth. I'm Jerry Pujols, your host, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to our esteemed guest for today's episode. With over 25 years of experience in the field, he is a true expert in helping individuals overcome challenges and discover their true potential. Please join me in welcoming my dear friend, John Wyman, a highly skilled professional who has worked extensively with major mental illness, depression, anxiety, and much more. His dedication to helping others navigate life's transitions and develop meaningful relationships is truly commendable. John's approach is eclectic, drawing on various evidence-based models such as dialectic behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, psychodynamic therapy, and solution-focused techniques. This diverse toolbox allows him to tailor his methods to the unique needs of each individual he works with. Prior to focusing on private practice, John held a significant role as the Chief of Social Work with the California State Hospital System. He has received prestigious scholarships including the California Pre-Doctoral Scholarship and the University of Michigan Merit Scholarship. Additionally, John has furthered his expertise through postgraduate fellowships with the Daiwa International Fellowship and Harvard Children's Hospital. His extensive training in counseling and neurobiology equips him to treat a wide range of patients and symptom profiles. Perhaps what speaks volumes about John's exceptional work is that nearly all of his clients come to him upon recommendations of previous clients. It's a testament to the positive impact he has made on all of their lives. So, without further ado, Let's jump into this captivating conversation with John Wyman, where we'll explore valuable insights, practical advice, and strategies for personal growth. Well, get ready to be inspired and empowered as we delve deep into the fascinating world of mental health with our special guest, John Wyman. Now, don't forget to subscribe to the Body Mind Index channel and hit that notification bell so you never miss an upcoming episode. John Wyman. So here we are. Thank you for doing this. Glad to be here, Jerry. I appreciate it. So, you know, I, I came up with this idea of having uh, a podcast. And the idea is somewhat selfish because I'm on this journey of, of getting healthier. But I, I had to decide what healthy meant, whether it was healthy and weight, healthy and endurance, and then as I was sort of thinking through that, healthy in mind has been a big deal for me. Um, I think you know that I suffer from anxiety, panic attacks. I've been taking Paxil, 30 milligrams of Paxil once a day for probably 25 years. Yeah. So that's a lot of information that I've just... In, my, in what I do, uh, uh, my primary mission right now is as a psychotherapist. Uh, we often call this wellness, this this attention and mindfulness that people who are reflective in the way that you are about life uh, think of all the parts of self. Um, how's my body? Am I taking care of my body? How's my mind? How's my um, how's my spiritual health? Like and and. Um, we're really blessed in many ways in this country that we have um, the luxury to be deeply reflective about this stuff and thoughtful and 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 sometimes it will really make choices, conscious choices about how do I how do I live a life that's more meaningful to me? How do I? What's my pathway to happiness to living the happiest life? Where I when I say maximize potential, I don't mean it in that old traditional sense of 
when I was a kid and you were a kid, I think that we thought, or at least I was taught, when my father said something like being successful, he was, it was inferred that that meant making a lot of money or doing well in school. And um, if, if I had, we live in this beautiful Napa Valley, there's like a lot of high net worth people here and my business has no, I, I, I see plenty of people who have had enormous financial success or um, um, sometimes a, 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 a success in athletics or something, but, but who are really now turning and asking these same questions of like, gosh, you know, like, I want, I want something deeper in life. I want to, to find more happiness. Happiness doesn't exist sort of outside us and all those things that I think that we used to conceptualize that more frequently. And so many people still do. You said something that that made me think of, you know, you said we're fortunate enough to live in a place where we can. So that left me with why do so many of us don't? Why do so many of us why do so many of us go on unaware? Yeah, it, it, unaware is a great word. I really love that you chose that. Um, and I, uh, as, as um, for, for, uh, for people who live a re reflective life, you can call it reflectiveness, mindfulness. In psychology, sometimes we call it self-differentiation, the, the noticing of our own thoughts and feelings. Um, um, it, it is true, and it's not just it's not it's not just a recent observation. Um, um, Thoreau said that masses of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Uh, uh, Hobbes said life is um, I'm going to misquote him probably, but short, brutish, and cruel. In other words, like this this the dissatisfaction with life has been uh, it's a it's a it's been a common element of the human condition or human experience, but. But I think maybe the, the part of the answer to your question lies in um, that hominids, like humans, hominids have been walking. We've been walking around as humans for about six million years. And the average life expectancy of a human in that six million years was about 32 years. And even before we developed as hominids, we developed as mammals. And we lived in a very, our brains developed, we developed as animals in a very predatory environment. And um, the process of the way natural selection works is that, is that those of us who, who worried, who were scared, who were except protective or defensive more readily, those genes tended to survive. The guys who were really casual and uh, um, happy-go-lucky, hey, Jerry, let's go down, you know, let's screw around by the river again. And maybe Jerry, is, uh, maybe our buddy says, you know, last time we were down there, there were cobras down there. Yeah. Right? Uh, like that guy made it more often than guys like you and me. So. Yeah. We're, we're not really designed as humans to be happy. It's not the natural condition. Like we have a luxury here when I talk about our, our, our relative wealth. We have a luxury here of being able to, to know, you and I, and probably everyone listening to this podcast, we're pretty darn sure that tonight we're going to go to sleep in a warm bed, have a roof over our head, have enough to eat. If our kid's sick, we can take him to the hospital. Um, that even though we are in a much less threatening environment, this is a very recent development in an evolutionary sense. And so our brains are designed to worry, to perceive risk. And we spend, we, we, there's the, the brain is hierarchical. So if you like kind of imagine, maybe, maybe most people out there can have probably seen a picture of a brain outside the skull, some kind of figure. But even if you haven't, if you just hold your fist up in the air and, and look at the top of those bumps along the, your fingers, 
or think about the top part of your brain, the top of your head. This is the neocortex. This is the newest part. This is what makes us human. The newest part of um, us as hominids. And uh, it was an exceptional um, evolutionary benefit. So as soon as this came along, we really separated from other, the other kinds of organisms that lived on the world. And we've come to dominate the world. I mean, so much so that, that now um, we're getting in the way of our own survival. But, but in any case, that, tar par that part of the brain that is able to weigh and choose and wait, other organisms don't have that. And that's the part that, that we like to get to as we make our wisest choices. But, but here's the challenge when you, your, your, your question was about um, um, what, what's the unsettledness or the unhappiness that exists that's so prominent? Why, why, doesn't, why aren't we satisfied? even with our, our enough to eat and our pretty nice house and, and, and the or, or, or head in the sand sometimes too, that, that yeah. unawareness, right? Unaware. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I, 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 the, so, so we were when talking about the brain structure, it's hierarchical. Okay. So, so, so we get stimulus up through the bottom part of the brain, not that top crinkly part where we like to be. And it has to go through a couple of important functional areas that assess risk and manage risk. And, the, and those areas are designed quite appropriately when we perceive risk to take over. So, so if you and I are down playing by the river and we see cobras, it's not, it wasn't adaptive or functional for us to weigh and choose our behavior for you to go, you know, I think that's an Eastern, isn't that, you know, that's an Eastern Mamba Cobra or something. It was adaptive. That's the, the old fight and flight for us to Hold act ass. immediately. <laughs> Just get out. Just right. Right. It, right. There is, so, so that part of our brain that's overdeveloped to assess risk because we developed in a much riskier environment, it, it still is doing that job. It's doing the job it was designed to do. So when, um, when there's a very slight, your, your sound guy just shifted on his feet a little bit, and there was just a tiny creak in the floor, I just mm -hmm, noticed. Mm -hmm. So usually we don't notice this, but we're talking about it, so I attended to it. But that part of our brain that assesses risk it is looking, it is assessing the risk in every stimuli, slight buzzing of the lights, um, uh, discordant, um, um, something that doesn't quite seem to match or, or be in place. It, it, it is doing its job. It's spending energy and calories in, in a form, in, in what we call arousal, where it's, it is, trying to pr protect us and take care of Hi us. Hyper awareness is there to protect us. That's right. Or what I call hyper, I consider myself hyper aware, always yeah. assessing. So that's such a, I, I thought that was unique to me, <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's unique to survival it and evolution, is. right? It is, and you were talking early, you mentioned people with their head in the sand or people that we don't think of as awake or aware. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think that, uh, it, this is not a unique observation to me that 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 many people who are responding to that part of our brain we call that the diencephalon mm -hmm. that assesses risk and decides how much do I arouse and manage this um, many people experience a lot of discomfort diencephalic discomfort that we call arousal and and are not very aware of that would say you know, we pulled 10 people walking by off the street and said, you know, how, how are you doing today? Unfortunately, in our culture, there's not a lot of tolerance for saying, you know, I, it's been really bumpy for me. I've been struggling, Jerry. I noticed I've been, 
kind of sad or melancholy in the morning sometimes. And uh, I'm worried about my kid right now. So, so we're taught to deny or push down what is real for us. And that, um, that causes real problems um, in that it, ta it, it takes energy. It, not only does it distort our ability to weigh and choose, but it takes an emotional energy. And to the extent that we don't accurately perceive like you said, you, you were talking about um, um, your, you had panic uh, disorder, panic attacks, sure. which I've had those too, by the way, and um, struggled with them. Mm -hmm. um, for f until we until we have the experience of beginning to live in what's real and true, I have had panic attacks. I have struggled with that sometimes too. Our chances of resolving that are infinitely lower, right? Like if I, if I acknowledge my own discomfort, then I really, I, I, I'm now I'm choosing. Sometimes there, when, when I don't acknowledge that discomfort, I, used, I spent a lot of my career in forensics working with people 30, 30 plus percent of them who had murdered somebody, right? And, and it's very common that people, when you're interviewing them about what happened, they'll say, well, I, I had to do it at that point. I had to. They, it, it, really what happened was they were, they were unconscious of their choice. So that part, that, that part of the brain is really fired up and we don't even notice, we call this state-dependent functioning that we have the choice or our own experience of arousal as ours. And, and unfortunately, when we don't notice that experience of arousal as ours, one of the, the, our mind often causes us a lot of problems. And one of the things that our mind commonly does when we're less aware is that we externalize our discomfort. That if I'm, that if I'm, um, let's, uh, um, anxious about this interview that if to if i'm unconscious of that i i would have more of a tendency to say to to put that off on you in some way oh you know jerry damn jerry scheduled this thing and blah 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 blah. not noticing my own choice and my own responsibility and making choices but instead to externalize it's very common that people enter treatment or therapy with me and uh, begin from a point where they are externalizing their problems. I say, you know, what they'll, they'll, they'll say like, you know, my, gosh, you know, my job, my boss is a real, uh, you know, he's unfair. He, you know, my, my, my wife is angry when I come home. My, so, so instead of acknowledging their feeling experiences, theirs, their, their response to the environment, their, their sense of anxiousness or anger, sadness, emptiness, as theirs, they'll assign it as if, if Jerry were different, if he had been, whatever, if he had called me three weeks ago instead of two weeks ago, right. if my wife wasn't feeling tense herself, she's just in her own pain, but, but we tend to externalize. And you, assign, you, assign, was, you assign it. You just, I assign it out. Yeah. I'm like, right. And that is in a really simplistic way we could separate higher functioning folks. And I say, I, I, I really work to not be judgmental. So when I, when, I, when I say higher functioning, I mean, I mean, folks that are less happy, if we did it in a really sort of a basic way, one way to look at uh, functioning is to notice that people who have an internal locus of control, who when they're uncomfortable, they ask themselves, how did I get here? What happened? I, gosh, I feel, I feel really panicky this morning. And so, like, like, it doesn't mean that I, that can be generated by all kinds of stimulus. And maybe it's not something that's part of my choice. But when I, when I recognize my emotional and feeling experience as mine, then I, that's an internal locus of control. I'm saying, yeah, you know, I'm uncomfortable. How did I get here? What might I choose? to change. When I have an external locus of control, I'm really like a little piece of styrofoam carried along the, 
r- raging river. <laughs> because it's like, you know, if Jerry would only change, if my wife wasn't snappy with me yeah. this afternoon, yeah. if my boss wasn't, you know, wasn't, could only see that I, you know, was, I'm busting my butt and the sales aren't there, but I'm really trying, we, we assign it outside, then we're very unlikely like even when even when we get those things that we're looking for money remember when you I, I remember i spent a lot of my life where i didn't have very much money in a relative sense i have a lot more money than i've ever had now and and i like having money I like i like um going to nice places or savoring we bought a new car recently you know you know, you know get in it and i'm like oh, it's just nice mm-hmm. but that that savoring moment of happiness is unsustainable and doesn't last very long. And unfortunately, if we're not awake, we just continue to try and solve that problem of happiness by getting the next thing, the next new car, the next. I, I, I years ago, I lived in a, a house that uh, um, with uh, a guy who's still a very dear friend of mine who owned the house. And he came home one day, and I don't know what I was, I was probably making 20, 25 bucks an hour or something. And he he came home one day, and he was upset, and he said, because he was making 80 grand a year. This was 25 years ago, but mm-hmm. he was like, I, he just felt like such a failure, and he had had a job where he had made a lot more. And I remember thinking to my, I remember saying to my wife, my wife, had, man, if I ever make 80 grand a year... I'll be, yeah, I'll never, I would never complain. I'll be the happiest guy in the world. You'll be happy. I'll be happy. You'll be happy. That's the, that's the story. That's the danger. Why is that? Why, why are we linked? Why, why do so many of us link happiness with money? Yeah. It's, well, you know, it's interesting. I, that we, we live in, ex, in, ex, in, an, in an extraordinarily consumptive culture, don't we? Like I reflect on this, and I'm part of it, Jerry. I, I'm part of it. I too. take my trash down to the road, and uh, it, you know, just the packaging alone for it's all the stuff I buy, it's and I'm trying to be awake to it. Yeah. And I'm still yeah. like, you yeah. know, I. Um, well, there, I believe that it, I don't know a lot about economics, but my my, my kids in college, so the conversations are in, in, in studying economics, and the conversations are really stimulating. But it, it is certainly true that um, that um, advertising has been extraordinarily successful. Like if you if 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 you look at a television ad for anything, a, a car, mm-hmm. what they show are people who are very happy, fit, fit. There's, beautiful beautiful everyone's attractive yeah yeah everything looks very easy yeah and um and if you think about the way life really is like let's imagine that you and i start a car company and we went out and we took the first two people off the street and we said we're going to shoot an ad and we stuck them in a car and instead of telling them to smile we just said we want we're just going to capture your natural be environment your, be yourself be yourself you know, we probably wouldn't sell very many cars, right? Unfortunately, we go towards that. Like we're attracted to that. That and that—that's another part of the adaptive. We, but we're, we grew up in these complex tribal communities where hanging around people who were um, attractive and fit and re- reflected a sense of power and relaxedness. That, that, those are still healthy people to be around. I like to surround myself with, yeah. with people who are healthy, and I don't mean, um, um, in that judgmental way of like, oh my gosh, uh, um, that person's struggling with their weight, so I won't be around them. But, right. but, but we we are designed to to notice that stuff and to attend to it, and are attracted to it. And marketing, I, they've done an extraordinarily good job of, of making those connections for us. And then socially, there's been a, there's a lot of reinforcement for that. You said something early on that I'm still grappling with is the uh, the casual 
how are you doing to somebody and how we tend to everything's great or i'm yes, doing or i'm yes, doing wonderful yes. and you said something that really stayed with me which is normally we're saying that a large percentage of the time when we're in the middle of we, an internal riff or something else is going on and and i'd love to hear more about what would you say is the implication or the impact of of that if i can call it lie yep i it is a it, it, it i i i I like calling it a lie, and I, 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 uh, even though you, as we're talking about it, it's it is almost invariably an unconscious lie, where we're lying to ourselves in that moment, and we're lying to the other person. And it's true that um, it's not adaptive if uh, you're at the grocery store and there's a long line. The woman behind you turns around and says, "Oh, I got, I got. That was a good deal on those." eggs today wasn't it that even if your dog died that day that you say like yeah that was killer you know yeah. like i right and and that's adaptive right like that's that's you you're you're at that point i would say we're not, we're not lying to ourselves right. um but relationships are kind of like a solar system i think of them there are people who are very close to us and, and then there are people that we may only meet once and briefly. And disclosure as we, as, as the, those people or planets in our own solar system come closer and closer to us, in a healthier way, we want to have these rich relationships where people can hold what's true for us, where, where that... Um, where that doesn't typically what happens this this is a sort of an easy experiment to try with your friends if you if you see someone that you know kind of casually and but, but they're definitely in your solar system and you disclose something that is real for you but unpleasant that some people will give you engagement cues probably fairly few people will say Oh, gosh, Jerry, I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me more. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been struggling? Like, what's it been like? Are you doing something for that? Like, is it, uh, you know, how does that Paxil work for you? Like, mm-hmm. what differences do you notice? Right? Those are, those are, those are gold nuggets. Those Uni- unicorn. Those are unicorns. Yes, they yeah, are. Yeah. Right. Because, because when I, we were talking about people who are unconscious of their own pain, when I'm unconscious of my own pain, and you and, and I say, "Hey, Jerry, how are you?" and you say, "Boy, John, you know I've struggled with panic attacks for years, and I have, I've had, I had a couple last week, and it was, it was really, well, if I'm struggling and pushing down the reality of my own anxiety, then you've just made it a lot more challenging for me yeah. to defend." The, the, the mind, unfortunately, the, the, our, our mind is, is much more often an exquisite device of torture for us than it is helpful. Most thinking is unhelpful. There's very, we call it helpful thinking instrumental thinking, where I, I weigh and choose and make a decision, and often that decision might be really satisfying. I have a lot of expertise about this. I'm... Um, you know, if I'm fixing, a, if someone's fixing a car or they're they're doing their vocation, they may experience that as really satisfying. That's healthy thinking. Or if I'm deciding to buy a house, you know, if I'm up, if I can get up to the top of my brain, which is a hard place for home buyers to get to, because boy, talk about an activated diencephalon, right? It's really scary. Yeah. But if I can get to that place, then I'm really can experience the joy of instrumental thinking. Wait, you know, like. Well, you know, I like the place over on Robinson so much better because of the pool, and uh, you know the f- the front is good. But on the other hand, like that's uh, yeah, that that's that's more. So I would have to work more. Um, that kind of thinking is healthy, but most of the thinking that we do um, is is really really unhealthy, and it's an attempt. Uh, our mind is attempting to protect us 
by going forward in time or backward in time and, and reviewing and rehearsing possible negatives or things that we said. And it tries to make meaning when we have, when we experience discomfort, anxiety or depression, even if I don't notice it, especially when I don't notice it, my mind tries to make meaning of that. Why did she say that to me? What's, I, there's not a, I don't understand. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. trying to think of something, a specific example, but we spend time attempting to make meaning of the chaos of life or why other people do what they do, and we're terrible at it. And so, um, I don't know, I've kind of wandered off your question, but, but um, that, that, that process of noticing our own feeling experience and not trying to move away from it and of noticing the things our mind says to us um, is it's interesting because psychology is is joining with the teachings of many spiritual leaders i'm not a particularly religious guy but clearly christ was a great teacher buddha was a great teacher um, the the idea that the journey inward and noticing is the pathway to happiness. There's an enormous body of research now supporting that this is, this is, this higher consciousness is a, is very additive to the human experience. And it's certainly like been my pursuit to try and practice that as I live each day to go toward living the most meaningful life. We only have so many moments. I talk to kids all the time. I talk to depressed teenage kids. And I remind them even that death is rushing at us. Like we, we have these individual moments and, and how do I want to spend this moment? And I want to be awake for it, even if I am noticing my sadness in it. Even if I'm with my panic, let's imagine that that, or if you want to close your eyes for a minute and even just imagine, I'll, I'm going to do this with you, like a time when I felt really panicky. I could even feel that in my body, right? And remember that and feel the sensation of that. And when I'm in a mindful place, I even welcome what is. And the, it, the interesting thing is, this is a trans, in my experience, this is a transformative experience. When I do this, it's very common as I, it helps me be awake and I notice almost immediately immediate beauty or sensory experiences around me. A smell, the way you have some beautiful wood shelving behind you. I just opened my eyes for a moment. It's just, just the, just the, it's very being, we can't escape pain in life. We are going to feel anxious sometimes. We're going to feel scared sometimes. We're going to feel alone sometimes. And it turns like that pain is inescapable. And it turns out that being with that pain, it's a very small part of most of the discomfort of life. And it's much more functional to be with it when it's here than to try and avoid it. And Jerry, I've, I mean, I think about the first half of my life, I, I tried, uh, you know, I, 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 I tried, I drank, I had these sort of, uh, uh, um, uh, I was definitely no, um, I was not the guy at the bar who was, you know, um, uh, all the girls were like, let me, let me give you my number, right? But I had a lot of kind of unsatisfying experiences where I'm like, uh, um, yes, it's, it's, um, all the things that we do to move away from, to try and move away from the, the discomfort, the feeling that's here with us. When it turns out, a very famous teacher, long, thousands of years ago, wrote this neat book where that essentially translates to the path is the way. And that it turns out that being here on the path, just being here is the way to feel the least discomfort, we will feel pain in life, but most of the discomfort that we feel in our life is suffering, which is added pain. 
it's when we identify with the things our mind says to us. She's not, if, if this isn't fair, or um, um, why did I say that? Or all this sort of trying to make meaning out of chaos. Um, that, that takes us away from being here and present, and it's a form of suffering. And that's, that it's, it's a way of not being with oneself, which, which is a, a life of suffering. I, 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 I spent much of my career as a hospital administrator. Um, that was a chief of social work at a, a large um, psychiatric hospital. And so I worked a lot with patients at the very end of life which is a common time that people may feel more awake, right? You're, you're really down to your last few days. And that, sometimes in a really beautiful way, like we want to be awake for this, or at least I would postulate that that's, that's uh, part of the path to wellness. Um, we wake up and see the things that are really important. Nobody talks about money at the end. Nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but it's pretty darn rare. And it's kind of sad if they do. Well, you know, I made a lot of money. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a thing. It no, shouldn't be a thing. Right. It's, it's uh, what they notice is I didn't talk to my son for several years because I was angry at him for some, or something that's pr clearly profoundly more important and was more important, but they were unable to see or notice until time became so short that it, the pain of that helped to waken them up. And so I, I, I like, that's why I like to remind teenagers death is rushing at you because it, we, do, we do want to capture each moment, I would argue, and be with. So that at the end, my hope is that someday when they're unplugging me, and you know, John, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever, that that I, my reflection is, gosh, you know, I, I, w I was really there for a lot of this. I really lived a lot of full moments, even the ones that were a struggle. I love that. <clears throat> I. Um... So you touched on some things that that I'm definitely connecting to. And maybe we can go into some of that at some other time, or maybe even on another episode, because there's there's a lot to to work through. And so many of the beautiful things you just said, I um, the one thing that stayed with me though is the the substance, mm -hmm. the substance to suppress or I don't know if you're about using alcohol or drugs or yeah or uh, food I have patients who food's a great one yeah. uh, um, there's sort of this laundry list and it mm -hmm. almost doesn't matter what it is right? it there's, the, uh, there's the common laundry list but uh, but yeah alcohol drugs food uh, um, busyness yes uh, uh, overwork overworking overwork, like yeah. I've got I've got to boy if I if I had a nickel for every if I stay, if I stay, bu if I, guy, yeah, I don't have to feel if I stay busy. And and for for every successful guy who my dad, uh, who uh, I've lost now, but but I loved very much. He he worked in Washington D.C. and we lived in suburban Detroit. He spent an enormous amount of his time away from our family. And I we lived in a in, a nice, beautiful house on a lake and so on, but like. Um, what would you do if you were a dad? You know, like looking back, like if, like what, what would you do if you were a dad? You go and and you, you're awake. My guess is that you want to go home, and and be with your kids, or or sit and look out over the lake of that big old house that you bought. And, and if you're the kid, you don't care about the house. You just want the time. Oh, with that's the dad. always true. It's funny. It's like I think as men especially. Yeah. We often um, compensate with yeah, the house. And, and, and there's a lot of social reinforcement mm -hmm. for the idea that you should be doing more. That if your kid is driving a new car instead of a used car, that if 
that if they go to this or that college or whatever, and you're exactly right. Like, um, I had a postgraduate fellowship in infant parent mental health, and I went in there sort of with um, the typical uh, undergraduate understanding of human development, you know, like there's uh, the developmental milestones, when will kids walk, be able to walk and talk and stack one block to two or to match colors or do things like that. So those were all what I had learned were the most important. <laughs> And I, it was a very rich fellowship. I was, I was very fortunate to land it. And what I came out of it with was that those things are not very important at all. It's the attachment. How it, like, 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 are the parents and children, does the, does the child have an attached, attuned, loving caregiver? Do they have, if, if they're lucky, do they grow up in a rich environment where they have multiple caregivers? Aunts and yeah. um, and uh, a, a neighborhood or a group of cousins and some old or some younger like that. That's wealth. I see my uh, I see my grandkids as being very wealthy. I see my children as being quite poor. Unfortunately, they have their mother who made up for a lot of that. But for a, from a father's standpoint, the focus was always so on being successful. You remember those years. Oh, yeah. Right? And, yeah. and, um, and I have my years, too, of um, judgment is in no way helpful. Like, 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 it's really important to notice what we did. Yeah. But I find judgment is very, very unhelpful when we look back. Mm -hmm. Like, so... So we are responsible for what we did, right? I'm responsible for uh, if I choose to um, talk to a patient uh, uh, from five to six who really I could have booked for tomorrow um, instead of going in and seeing my kids. Like, I'm responsible for that choice. Um, but it doesn't help us to judge ourselves about this stuff. It, it really gets in the way seeing and noticing that's true that was me i was doing the best i could in that moment that was me as i saw the world in that moment that's that that's wisdom when i when i notice the pain of that i won't get that moment back those moments back i want to be like i, I can notice that yeah yeah, and, and maybe and maybe that pain is what's causing the awareness with the grandchildren. It helps, doesn't it? It, it does. Yes. I think it does a lot. It, right. If I don't see the pain of that, if I'm unconscious to the pain of that, then um, then I'll almost certainly replicate the mistake of right. trying to love my child. But I remember our son Dustin was maybe about three or four. And for the first time, Mindy and I were making money that we just hadn't anticipated ever making and we bought a we bought that big house on dickerson you sold us god bless you that was a wonderful house to raise kids in <laughs> and that has a big living room you'll remember the the living area where the fireplace is the the floor from the fireplace to the middle of the living room was covered in gifts yeah covered i mean it was so stacked and i um at that time, I was happy and proud that I had done that. So much more than I ever dreamed of having. And he got about a third of the way through those presents. He was three or four. And he fell apart. He's totally dysregulated. You know, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, like it's like it, 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 it. it even as excited as a three-year-old is about a, a, a new truck. Too yeah, much is too much. Oh, it, it, right. It was, it was, there was very, you know, he couldn't savor that in the way we were talking about savoring earlier, right? Um, yeah, like that, that was. The cruelest thing I ever, mean. the cruelest thing I think I ever did to my kid was walk into a Toys R Us and said, get anything you want. Yeah. And the look on their faces were... What are you remembering? I just remember confusion. 
I remember wow. opportunity right. lost, like I'm going to get the wrong things. I know I can't get all of it, so I know I'm going to get the wrong. Th I mean, it was so painful that at that moment right then and there, I knew I made a huge mistake. There was some, I, I like, you know, I know she used the word mistake. And I like noticing when I use that word. And, and I try to avoid using that word mistake. So you, you were choosing there, just like I chose to fill that room mm -hmm. full of mm -hmm. presence, right? Mm -hmm. Right? If, like, I would say that's a, that, was a, that was a really important moment for you. Yeah, it you was. grew, right? You, yeah. you, you chose. Like, I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't do it again. You weighed. Yeah. You, you, you know, you, you, you made your best choice. Like this is, this is, not even that we had this thought. This was all this internal dialogue that happened reflexively, automatically. Yeah. I love this kid so much. I want to give him the world. The world. And you offered him the world, and you know, oh gosh, you know that. That didn't work. That wasn't very helpful. Yeah. When I notice it like that, where it's not a mistake, where I can be like, yeah, that was, that was, I was doing the best I could. I noticed like that didn't work very well. That, that, that didn't seem helpful. Then I, then, then I can, I'm, it takes the judgment out and it's a little easier for me to be in a wiser place. And I'm, we're both on the, on the pathway, that. brother. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not your Buddha. You're not my Buddha, right? Like, we're both on this pathway of just, of just trying to notice. Not a prophet, and, barely a student. Yeah. <laughs> barely. Well, uh, you know, it's funny. They, they call mindfulness a practice, and I really like that word. <laughs> because there is, in my experience, there is no, there is no end where you're on top of a hill somewhere. And you're like, you know, I'm really all done. Like I'm, it's certainly true that I have tended to feel more grounded and happier as I have pursued this and aged, but, but we're just practicing. And I may have a, I may have a panic attack. I may walk out of here and, and have a panic attack or do something that is very, or, or, or it's a better example would be to say, I may, I may do something that is very unconscious. Yeah. It's possible. And I want to see and be with the reality of that. And then if I do look at it, like what happened for me there? I chose something that, that didn't work out because I still do that. Really interesting. So going back, what are your thoughts about going back to, to food, uh, alcohols, legal or illegal yeah, substances, yeah. anything that suppresses? Yeah. Our feelings. Why? Why do we do that? In, food is an especially good one for it because um, um, food is nurturing, and we are. If we're drinking, if we're watching internet porn, if we're dissociating, if we're overworking, we are trying to take care of ourselves. We are trying to ease our own pain. Every organism from the, from the single-celled amoeba to, to hominids are trying to move toward anticipated satisfaction, pleasure, or ease, and away from anticipated pain. And, um, and food is, uh, we, food's, food's is especially tricky because it is nurturing. We need food. Eating eating well is part of wellness. I think it's often trickier, much trickier, for people who who use food than for people who use alcohol or drugs because um, you don't need alcohol or drugs to live. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I. <clears throat> I have a couple of episodes on the podcast, one by Dr. Goldhammer and another one by Dr. Lyle. They're co-authors of a book called The Pleasure Trap. Mm. And it's literally the premise of the book is, you know, what what food has done to us post-World uh, War II and the foods, the way they were loaded with sugar, oil, yes, and salts. Yes, and, yeah. and it sort of put us on this hamster wheel that you, we just literally from a 
from a dopamine uh, standpoint, we can't even get off of it because yeah. we're just constantly bombarded with these uh, reward. Uh, They've really hacked yeah. um, the neurobiology of reward and arousal. Um, and and um, this is unfortunate. This is happening with social media, too, right yeah. now. It's, yeah. it's, it is... Um, it is... I'm just as addicted to food as I. It's the next. The phone. I'm I'm as addicted to yeah. that iPhone as I am to food. And they've hacked it. Like they, they've hacked into like our reward these, these reward systems in the brain. Yeah. And uh, they very almost, much almost like this. Almost like the slot machines in Vegas. Yeah. This these little devices are the slot machines. They just keep us putting another dime in it. Yes, that's right. And and yeah. it's very sensory. Uh, it surrounds us and the culture supports it. Yeah. You and I could go out. We went, we took uh, my son out to a birthday dinner the other night somewhere and spent about 500 bucks on, um, you know, the sort of food that had been exquisitely prepared and made and the savoring and, and, and like, there's nothing wrong with the mindful experience of savoring. Let's say that you have a, a piece of chocolate or something like that. There's, there's, it's, it's not right or wrong to have that piece of chocolate, but I want to be awake yeah. as I take, as I eat that, and notice. And it's so, so if I choose to, you know, order cheesecake at the end of the meal or whatever, I, I want to, it's, I want to notice what happens for me, and I don't mean in a way that's. Um, that's worrisome. I mean, to be present with, what's this like for me? The texture, the flavors, the that but moment. Also, the to notice. Um, there's different kinds of. There's. A, uh, it's funny because I'm I'm a shrink, so everything's a gray area. But I often talk about good guilt and bad guilt. Yeah. And and good guilt is where I've I've done something that has violated my own values or that's unhealthy for me. I've ordered a piece of cheesecake and 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 I notice, you know, this is not this is not this is a choice I made that, that And it hits not, and it hits it hits me wellness. that hits me right away. Yeah. Almost after the first but even from the moment I ordered it, it's already hitting yes, me. Yes, yes. Right. There's there's a yeah. mixed feeling that, that we want to stay with, right? Feelings are really complex. And it's funny that we I'm in this role where often I'm asking people um, what came up for you? What's the feeling part of that experience? What's the, where do you notice the sensory part of that experience? But the truth is that, that feelings that, that, any, that words that we use, like I feel guilty or ashamed or alone, or um, that those are very reductionistic. Feelings are really complex. We have to reduce them to symbolic language so that we can, you know, communicate. We can say like, oh, Jerry, I, yeah. you know, I, I, I noticed that too. I felt uh, ashamed when I was guilty when I was eating that. Um, uh, but I think going back to food as um, as a way of separating from ourselves and from being present, um, uh, I, I think that it, it, food is particularly tricky in the early part of recovery or or the move toward wellness because it's not as simple it's not going to your dealer anymore yeah um it, it is uh entirely a mindfulness experience where um it, it, i used to to drink more than was healthy for me and and one of the ways i addressed that was to to absolutely stop drinking for a while and that's a very simplistic outside the body. You know, it's not, that's not the most mindful. It's not right or wrong to drink. I don't, even the people who are sitting down at the eight o'clock in the morning watering hole, they get to choose what they do. I, I may look at it and, and, and observe it. That looks kind of like probably a pretty painful life of unconsciousness. But I don't, I think right or wrong is like a, sort of this, um, um, this concept in our mind that's typically not very helpful. But it, 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 food is, um, it's entirely a mind, that like, like the recovery and wellness, going toward recovery is entirely a, 
a mindful experience that it's much more complex because you can't abandon food. It's, I want to say a, a funny observation about food. My first wife was a psychologist and I still have this uh, thing that I do that I love vanilla ice cream. My, my family often teases me because we'll go to this, you know, this, you know the, whatever. Now they have these ho homemade ice cream stores that are, you know, they have every flavor from whatever. And I'll get up to the front of the line, you know, and everybody else is having like lavender and mint or something. Right. And I'm right. like, I'll have the vanilla, right? <laughs> She's a psychologist, but I, I, I used to love to have ice cream. And then as I became more mindful, I would choose only to have it. If I was like, you know, I've had kind of a tough day. I want to, I want to purposefully choose something nurturing for myself. I'm going to get a vanilla ice cream, still do this. But her, she made this sort of uh, psychoanalytic connection with, you know, it's interesting, like ice cream is literally milk. It's like, like how, how, what's our, what's, what's our primary nurturing experience when we come out? It's like, we're dysregulated. Yeah. Mom holds us to her breast. We drink milk. It, we experience like it's reinforced. It's warm. It's satisfying. We can feel we're laying against her, feeling her warmth, hearing her heartbeat. Our respirations are matching hers. Super regulating, joining, comforting experience. And it's funny, I, ret I return to something that's pretty close to that when I'm kind of dysregulated sometimes and have my ice cream. That happened to me one time. I was, uh, me and my mother have a interesting relationship and uh, we haven't spoken probably for somewhere eight to ten years. Yeah. What I find fascinating is that my mother is a an ordained swami. Um, so you know we, she was exposed to to yoga for many years, and we've had a a swami who I still respect, and I think my siblings do as well. He's a wonderful person who's devoted his life to. To the service of, of others and my mother always uh, sort of I think trying to follow in those steps and trying to heal her own pain she she worked through it and she became ordained and she's a swami but it's hard for me to still wrap around wrap this around my head that I have a mother who's a swami who can't have a relationship and, with her and there's and this, there's this profound dis oh disconnect. huge huge disconnect and I remember one time before she was a Swami, already many years of practice, she came up to San Francisco to do some further university studies or something she was doing and took my kids. I'm running late. I have four kids. We're going to go see her. They're going to go see grandma. And because I showed up late and that seemed arrogant to her that I showed up late, mm -hmm. she wouldn't open the door to her hotel. She literally yeah. said, I'm not seeing any of you today. And I was so broken on the drive back. So much anger. Oh, like, like, like I, I like to stay out of other people's heads, but, but the, the pain, like to, the the pain. Her experience of that, whatever, whatever, however she that made sense to her. We were talking about the murderers who would say, "I had to do that." Right? She had like to do that. She had to, and it could have been triggers from my father. Who knows? I mean, so all many we know things. is it's pain. It was pain. And and but but it was out. It was pushed outward. This is what happens. So when we're unconscious of our own pain, we it we transfer it to our children. And then it affects my us. children because my children witness all that yes. and their father crying. And and I called my sister on the way. And then I just offloaded on my sister. And going back to what you were saying about the ice cream, all I can tell my sister at that point was, all I wanted to do was hug her and put my head on her chest. Yeah. That's all I wanted to do. Yeah. At that moment, that's all I needed. I love it. I love your consciousness in that, um, because I um, the most frequent person that, that that I mean, insults to attachment are are um, really a powerful force. Early insults to attachment are a really powerful force. They're very predictive of wellness, of whether you'll have a mental illness, be incarcerated, how long you'll live, whether you smoke or drink, whether you have diabetes. Um, and, and when I am 
dysregulated. What we really, when we're dysregulated, what, what soothes us is nurturing. Is, yeah. and, that's, and that's what soothes, that soothes us in the beginning. For those folks who are, are, were fortunate enough to grow up with really attached, attuned, loving parents in those rich environments, they, the, the brain develops, uh, there's a, a, a guy that I, I know a little bit who often, uh, he's a well-known uh, neurobiologist who often said, points out the brain develops in a use dependent way. And, and so for those of us that when we were dysregulated, when we were little, our mothers picked us up and held them to their breast and said, Oh, it's going to be okay. And moms, this is internally wired for so many moms. You don't have to teach them any developmental neurobiology. They well, not, are not, tuned. They notice. Did you? I know you've you've had kids, and I know that your kids are older now. But did you know that now there is a thing that when a child is born, they make sure that the mother has that child skin to skin right yes, away. Yes. That wasn't a deal when I had kids. Yes. That wasn't even a thing. Yes. And there's something. And then even Jerry Jr., my son, as a father, would put the child skin to skin right away in the bonding and the nurturing of that newborn baby. And it's, yeah, it's in our, it's in our biology that we, we need that nurturing. When, as our brains are developing, when, when you held Jerry Jr. as a little baby... Which even, you know, you were saying, gosh, you know, I was unconscious sometimes in a mm-hmm. lot of ways during mm-hmm. that time. But, but you certainly had the, also these experiences where you were there and you, yeah. you held him and you, when you held him to your chest, he felt the warmth of your body. Respirations are mm-hmm. usually around 16 respirations a minute. He, he, your, he, he felt your respirations and literally his brain is wiring. It, it, the brain develops in a use dependent. It's literally use. He's using that experience. His brain is using that experience to wire for regulation. He hears your heartbeat about eighty beats a minute, which is four or four times. It's why we tend to dance it. Hmm. You know, it, like we we uh, that that experience is uh, exceptionally profound and. Um, there, there's a, a good friend of mine, Christy Brandt, who's a uh, just a gifted uh, researcher and lecturer about uh, early developmental neurobiology. Um, um, she often points out the imp- how important and formative these experiences are, and even that kids who are in the NICU where they're held regularly. The moms yeah. go into, they're in a, they're, 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 they do everything they can do to bathe them in the, the, the they have these, the, the beds that they sleep in rock and are warmed and they're held quite often. But those kids show differences in, in, that are apparent in neuroimaging at age 25, even if they were only in the NICU for a couple, three months. Like that's, it's, 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 it's observable years and years later. These experiences that were formative for us, um, it's why people who do what I do often go back uh, and talk about the narrative of that life. And really what people are doing is when they, they connect with the pain of what, as a, as a child, we, we are wired to desperately seek the approval of our parents. Who, which genes lived, Jerry, right? Like, the, like if you watch, uh, they used to have that show Mutual Omaha, but there's, there's those, um, any nature show you watch, you'll see if you if you see like a antelope in Africa on the savanna, the mom and the baby sort of trailing behind, right? And if the mom is not very attentive, maybe she's a little bit impaired as a mom in her own way, compared to a human mom, maybe she's 
mm-hmm. keeps wandering away from the child. Where we all know how that ends. That kid, that 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 that, that little no antelope chance. is probably going to no, get eaten. No chance, right? Yeah. That little antelope, that, our our best chance as mammals, especially as hominids, because human babies, we don't just drop out like a giraffe and get up and walk. Human babies take an unbelievable investment yeah. before they are able to sustain and function on their own. So um, our best bet, no matter how impaired that parent relationship is, we're wired as little kids to want to have our head on our mom's breast. Even when she, even when she, you know what I mean? Like, even if she is like, you get away from me right. and locks you out of your, <laughs> locks you in your room. And like that, that we're, we're wired to keep trying to go back. And, um, and it's why when parents have their own pain or are impaired, um, that pain gets translated down. And I think the most noble journey is, is the kind of journey that, that you're talking about and that you're on. The most noble journey, I think, is that when we come from these places where, um, where we didn't get enough, as if there's enough, right? Mm-hmm. But, but we didn't get enough. Where we become awake to that, and we let go of the judgment for who our parents were when they were, even when they were so unconscious, they were slamming the hotel door on their grandkids, right? Right. We. we and we let go of the self-judgment and we begin to live in a world where we are we are aware of our own pain and it, and when we have empathy when i'm in that place where i'm i'm not my pain i'm observing my own discomfort then i can have empathy for my own discomfort that was hard for me Jerry, my own mom had her own, had, was, really had a lot of struggles too. And where I look back and I think of that little boy, I think, yeah, that was, that was really hard. And I have empathy for him and his struggle. And, and my experience is that as I have empathy for myself in that way, it just rules out from me. I have empathy for others in the world around me. This, I, I, there's, I often you often see these little, little signs about like loving you have to love yourself or something, and it's a kind of kitschy signs or But I I, I think that it is true that that the, the noblest path ironically is to love oneself. And I don't mean in the egoic way of I'm buying a new Audi because I deserve it because I've been. I mean to to have compassion for ourselves. For doing for for working those extra hours, because I was trying my best to take care of my kid as I it was in the way I saw the world in life. I was trying to take care of myself, of my family. That's where I was, and I had to go there to be here. Where I have empathy for that guy, I have empathy for myself as I am. If I feel uncomfortable, ah. Oh, Life is hard sometimes. And then I have, have it's like the love just rolls out toward the world. Everything good comes from that, from healing and loving ourselves, I think. That's the, that's the one thing I find myself connecting with is that, that self-care part. That's the one thing that I can sort of make tangible that... Because I'm seeing it work. I'm seeing that. What do you notice when you say that? Like, what are you noticing? So I notice that, you know, I notice that if I have a practice where I get up in the morning and I I do something as simple as write five things I'm grateful for in a journal ah, right great, before great, I brush my teeth. Every single morning I've been doing that for months now. I love that. And it's I see I see things shifting. And then from there, I lay in bed for a few minutes with Susan. From there... Then I go to the gym. Then from there, I've been doing sauna like four or five days a week. And then I take an insanely cold plunge shower or something, whatever's cold that I can go into. 
just that one practice without going into the others that I'm doing, which I'll tell you about later, is um, it's making me so much, and I'd ha you'd have to ask Susan, but f through my lens, it's making me so much better for her. I feel like I have this love and this um, excitement about seeing Susan that was almost dulled, yeah. you know, by life. And well, by, you, were le you were less, when, uh, to the extent that I am less conscious. Way life. less conscious. Yes. Way less conscious. So now we, I mean, today I went, uh, I went golfing with Susan today. I hate golf. Yeah. But it's something that Susan loves. And if Susan loves it, why don't I share in on You're something? sharing it. That's right. And she's just getting the biggest kick out of me hitting a good one or hitting a bad one. Yes. She's she's just laughing, loving it, and it's making me laugh and love it. And those are the things that I find are really working. Yeah. And then the so other, you were talking you're talking about self love yeah. and self care yeah. and and how it's not you're free when you're the, when, the more you're there. It's not even work to oh. think of times where you came home and interacting with your wife or family felt like work. Like, I'm not like pointing at you. I'm like pointing at my own experience. I'm pointing at like we've all had this experience where we're less awake in some moment, less self-noticing and loving. And, and you're talking about the kind of awakening that happens when we're in a place of self-love and higher consciousness and going toward the richest part of life, which is intimacy, shared experience. Whether you were golfing or stamp collecting or... Doesn't even matter. I talk to all these dads who can't figure out how to connect with their kids. Yeah. And it's like, man, you know, what do you do? I set tile. Have you ever taken your kid to set tile? Yeah. Or done something like yeah. that with him? You know, yeah. like it is... It doesn't matter what that intimacy is. It's that's the part that when people are the people that we were talking about who were close to the end are waking up, that's the part they notice where they missed it or where they had it. I remember golfing with you, Susan. Is there something evolutionary about our connection to nature? You, oh, nature is well, yeah, there's um. It's a, it's a, that's a, it's a wide connection. That's certainly true. So that diencephalon, we talked about that assesses risk. So if you think about it, like even before hominids walked the earth, we, we developed as mammals, like we, that part of the brain is very old, very old. And it, it developed in naturalistic environments. And I connect with that so deeply, and I hope it's one of those things that I can get out there to people, that connecting with that, it's game-changing in so game many changing. ways. There's something called the nature effect. Huh. Uh, these profound changes that happen for people when they're out in nature, especially out in nature for three days or more. Yeah. Uh, there's all this we call down-regulate, like... like um, we really are designed to be in nature. You know, remember I was talking about how our diencephalon has to notice um, um, uh, every little noise, even a noise that is that wasn't present uh, 3,000 years ago, like the, uh, the very slight buzzing of the lights. Very slight, so small that we don't even... But, but our diencephalon has to attend to that, and it's not designed to notice and assess that risk. And so it, 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 there's much more arousal. It, it was designed to assess the stimulus like the wind as it blew through the trees. It's funny you say that because one of the, you know, I, you probably know this, that six, seven years ago I, I did a through hike out on the John Muir Trail, which is only 2020 something 200 200 no 20 200 and something miles i just i just made some friends on another trip that i just went to they're doing 2600 miles and they're on a six month track but i did 17 days on the john muir trail and and i remember rarely having felt as alive as i felt when i can hear the wind 
hit the leaves on these particular trees and the sound that that made. It was probably the closest to what I would imagine heaven would be like or if you died and you woke up and what nirvana would have been like it was yeah. the sound of those leaves and how they uh, yeah. how they hummed in the wind it was so perfect you know and um, that's a that is that's a um, a beautiful example and I, I, it only I've happens in nature I've it only had that same sort of uh, that it, it is interesting like that um, we talk about the hack of media television of which is which is um my older brother a hundred years ago i went over to visit him and he was living in this apartment with a roommate and someone had put a bumper sticker on the television that said television is a drug and boy you know it's like the drug started early drug isn't it drug started early well and it's like i i i have had the experience often of sitting and watching television and noticed that I was not living my own life. I was watching another life, yeah. but it's not mine. And there's, uh, it's a way of being away from, and you, when you're talking about nature, just, um, it, it is, it is work and we to turn toward being here and it takes effort. And the, I think the reason I do it is what is because it got painful enough at some point to that, that this is now my, the pathway that I'm trying to practice as much as possible. And, um, and, but I love your, your noticing the connection with the natural world. And I've had that. I was sitting out in my backyard last night. It was interesting. The rest of the family was in the house and and just uh, being. And I, I um, there was any other, uh, yeah, anyway, there was a there was a there was a bird in the tree. You know, it's just the littlest. Things I was going to say it's something like that, that. That I was just full of the curiosity and yeah. wonder and openness. And it could be the sound of your family in the background. Oh, sure. Right? I mean, you just hear those little voices and you're just like in nirvana. You're like, wow. When I have those moments, you used the term rich a while back when you were referring to um, relationships like that. that, That's when I feel rich, when I'm having that kind of experience. Those moments. I've been doing the cold baths, too. My my pool is unheated and it's not it's still pretty chilly. So, but I jump in. Every That'll day. do it. And I I um, while I'm in there, I'm in there alone. I go to do it. No one else. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to. <laughs> it's like we go to the ocean. I I go in the ocean. It's me and everyone else there is uh, 50 years younger than I am. Everybody, all the adults are at the beach. But but anyway, like I'm just there. Um, You've seen my backyard. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's. I, I really enjoy that yeah. space, yeah. and I'm I'm just looking up at the trees and listening to the wind. And it's beautiful. It's nice stuff. It's good. Yeah. So I, have, I have a couple of things because Edisham has been throwing us the hook for about right. ten minutes, yeah. and I want to be mindful of your time. And I also want to say that I I could keep talking to you for another two hours straight. So I want you to know that Thanks, that buddy. I can I, 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 I can really keep going. I really enjoy you jerry uh as a human being and um uh i I love your your openness your generosity it's just i don't know it's been a rich relationship for me and it's funny like we're not we don't it's not like we we yeah we don't don't go go golfing we don't go to we don't we don't go to the bar but when i see you i um i uh I really enjoy you. Yeah, I was. I've, I always feel quite home when I'm around you. Yeah, right on, brother. Always do. Yeah. So I'd love to do this again. Yeah, me too. I'd love it to do it again. It. And maybe it'd be really fun to do it on one of our lives. So sure. if people have questions, Edishan can feel them and maybe we can real right time on. real time just dive into their world and, and see if there's some impact we can make there. Or Yeah, you know, I, I, have, um, there, I have thoughts about talking about like specific like anxiety would be an interesting Same here. one. Same like, here. Like to, to, to really talk about things that are specific and what um, 
what tends to be helpful for yeah. people and uh, yeah. because I'll, I'll, well, well, in self-care and people with kids that are, are having a hard time putting themselves first, you know, you have single moms out there that are, uh, they're going to argue and push back and say, how the fuck do you expect me to self-care? You know, yes, I got to get yes. up at six o'clock in the morning to have kids ready to go to school by seven. And, and then I got to be back and pick up a baby to take him to yes. my mom's, you know, yes. it's just hard. It is. I, it's funny. You said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to immediately after this though I'm, I'm going back to my office and i'm going to see a patient who's um who's a single mom and uh came to me after uh, an extremely difficult a series of both developmental experiences and uh, and e even as an adult and she sees me on her lunch hour and um and i just it i love what i do like she's, it's been a transformative experience for her, and I'm just sort of a tool there, right? Just asking, just an instrument, questioning, and going toward it. But yeah. she's done a lot of great work, and that's it's what I'm. I guess the message there is that um, you can you can not have a roof over your head, not have enough money, not have all kinds of things, and pursue this path that we're talking about. Um, it's available to all of us and it's available immediately. What I find interesting beyond that is what actually opens up and transpires when you when you start that practice of really self-care. Yes. Yeah. You're almost at a different frequency. You're at a different vibration. Things For just, sure. It, it, I find that fascinating. Yes. 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 I... Um, uh, we, I, I always I keep wanting to open up new topics when, whenever you say something. Me too. Oh, me too. Yeah, Trust yeah. me. I, yeah, I, I want to go. Every time we say something, I get triggered into let's keep going. Yeah. So that's why I love the idea of doing it. Yeah, I have a few ideas that might be yeah, really we'll, cool. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll go offline and do yeah, those. Sounds good. But I want to thank you, man. It's been a delight to be here. Thanks, Jerry. Love you. Love you too, buddy.